I would like to engage with you in a study of the Bible pertaining to character, actually. We'll be looking into the Old Testament and uh, look at a certain person here I'll mention in just a moment. But character has to do with our moral attributes, such as honesty and so on. And in, when it comes to a Christian, of course, I think we have to add to that the reason that we are what we are, and it's because we want to please God. We want to serve God. We want to obey God. Because that makes us inwardly, in our heart, what we ought to be. And thus we're taught to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. And we're taught to meditate on the Word of God. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, and so forth. So we're taught to think good thoughts, Philippians 4. And thus we keep ourselves moving and developing in a, in a character or, or developing a character that is like unto Christ. Now, I don't know of any other way that you can be like Christ other than to fill yourself with the mind of Christ. And we're taught to let the mind of Christ be in us. And thus we choose the way to live this life as Christ tells us how to live it. And thus it's the life of a servant. First of all, faithful servant to God. And as he directs us to one another. We are a people of integrity. We are a people who are striving after the truth. The truth matters. And we know what truth is. We know what the plan of salvation is. We know what the church is, etc., etc. We know what a moral life is. A moral person doesn't lie, doesn't murder, doesn't cheat, doesn't steal. It's right the opposite of that. So we're speaking of character. And to do this, I want us to look at an Old Testament character by the name of Elijah. And we'll simply call him God's faithful prophet. He was one among many who were faithful. But Elijah is a very great man. So there are moral attributes, spiritual attributes, or characteristics that we can learn from him that can help us be faithful servants of God in the Lord's church today. I think you will notice one thing about Elijah is that he was a great, loyal, courageous prophet of God. Remember, a prophet is one who speaks for another. In the case of the prophets of God, God put into their mouth what they should say. They did not deviate to the left hand or to the right. They said exactly what God told them to say. And so it is when we as members of the New Testament church live our lives, then we speak as the oracles of God. We fill our minds with the truth. And when we express ourselves on something, then we're quoting the truth. I don't just mean we quote scripture, although that's a great thing to do, but we have to use an old word, imbibed it to where we put it into our own words and actions. And thus there's much to see in people like Elijah from the Old Testament as to spiritual matters in the church today. So I'd like to note some of the characteristics of Elijah that are worthy of our imitation today. First of all, and this is the key to all of it, no great thing except in doing it. To understand it doesn't take a great intellect. It's simply that Elijah was willing and ready to obey God. That to me is the beginning of any person service to God. Ready and willing to obey. Because it implies that I'm not going to have it my way. Wherever I see my way conflicting with God's way, my way gets put aside, God's way gets done. You see that in Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first 
the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You'll remember that in the days of Elijah, there was a king called Ahab. And to say the best about him is that he was the intense enemy of anything that pertained to God and to God's people. He excelled, according to 1 Kings 16, 30, in doing that which was evil, that is, that which broke God's law and was contrary to it. And then in verse 33 of 1, Corinth, or rather 1 Kings 16, it says this, He did yet more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all of the kings of Israel before him. Now that's some character that he has that kind of mentality. But then there's Elijah that's brought up during the time of this wicked king. Have you ever wondered how many times some of these people said, I wish I could have lived in a time to where I did not have to deal with what happened to Elijah when he dealt with Ahab and Jezebel and all the, the fallout over that. But we don't get to pick the time that we live on this earth. When, whenever we live here, whether we, if we lived 100 years ago, 200 years ago, today, or if time goes on, we live 200 years from now, we don't get to pick that. What we do get to pick is how we live the lives God gave us at the time he put us on this earth. So this is the time of Elijah. It calls for great moral character and spiritual dedication to God above all else. So regardless of the evil of this man, God commanded Elijah to go and show himself to Ahab. And there's no complaining or trying to get out of it. He willingly obeyed God, 1 Kings 18, 1 and 2. Now, that required courage. We read that in the scriptures and we just pass over it. It's like it was just, all right, no problem here. No possibility of any consequences, but there, there were great consequences that could have come upon him. But there's no indication because of his character and his faithfulness, his dedication and to God and love of God that he even began to think that, well, I'm not going to do this. I could get my head cut off. He just did what God told him to do. So he was a courageous person. He brought his own inclinations and desires and likes into subjection to the will of God. Now, sometimes I think we get the idea, well, he was just going to do this anyway. He didn't have to make a decision. God told him, and he just did it. No, he had to say, I am going to do this. You this morning got up, and you chose to be here. Now, I don't know all of the reason you chose to be here. I like to think I do. But you still chose to be here. So it required courage for Elijah to confront one who was more than happy to kill him. And we see that in the rest of his, his life. God commanded the prophet to go to Ahab. And the point I want to make is that there's no quibbling. There's no trying to get around God's commandments. They are divine commandments. He's a servant of God. So whatever God commands him, he sets about to do. Christians, as the Bible uses that term, whenever they're on the earth, since the Lord's church has been established, if they're faithful to God, Christian again means of Christ. If you are of Christ, then you're ready to do whatever it is that God enjoins upon you as one of his faithful children. In the case of today, you're ready to come together as he instructs through his son, authorizes us to act in the worship of God. And you want to understand how to worship him in spirit and in truth. For God seeketh such to worship him, Jesus said in John chapter 4 and verse 24. So those who truly love God will gladly keep his commandments. 
John 14, verse 15. It doesn't do any good to say I love God and then try to figure out ways to get out from doing, out under what he charges us to do. We have an obligation to teach people the truth. Doesn't mean you have to be a preacher like me, but you have to preach the truth wherever you have the opportunity. Some of the greatest pulpits that have ever been erected has been a neighbor talking across a fence to another neighbor or somebody visiting with somebody when they're in their home and they take advantage of the opportunity or they create an opportunity to talk about the Bible and to go gradually as you can and have the opportunity to develop that kind of association. So we, we must always be ready, if you please, to preach the gospel according to our status, Romans 1 and verse 15. There Paul pointed out in the next verse is where he says the gospel is God's power to save. He made it clear that he was ready to preach the gospel to those who are at Rome also. So it's the power of God concerning salvation to everyone that believes. And we who have participated in the study and understanding of the truth and learned the gospel or somebody taught it to us need to have that same concern for our fellow men. I often remind myself somebody had to love God well enough to prepare themselves to teach me how to become a Christian, and have enough interest in me to help me be what I've tried to be for many years. I'll never forget when Brother Chester Phillips came up on a Wednesday night. I almost can walk probably within three or four feet of where I was standing and said, I talked to the brethren out at this little country church called Two by Old Church of Christ, and they're willing to have some of you boys come out there and preach for them. Well, I never preached. I'd made it known I wanted to preach. And they said, do you want to go? Well, that put the onus on me. You know, I talked about it. Now the opportunity's come. I didn't know it was even going to come, but he was one of the elders of the church where I was. And uh, he had a brother-in-law that went out there. And so he came up and said, do you want to go out there and preach? They can use you every Sunday. I had a speech class in college. I was enrolled in another speech class. And, you know, I just didn't have any better sense than to say, yes, I'll go. Or else I was too afraid not to, or maybe it's a little of both. But I wanted to. That was the main thing. If, listen, if you don't have the want to, you won't. You've got to have the desire. And, and if you don't want to obey God, you won't. If you don't want to study the Bible, you won't. You don't see that in men like Elijah. They're willing not only to bring their own personal lives in subjection to what God wants them to do to be saved from their sins, but they're willing to go out and put their necks on the line, and that's exactly what God was asking Elijah to do. They'll confront enemies of the cross with God's good word, with the truth of God's will, and they'll do it for one reason only, because it's their duty as a faithful servant of God to do it. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3. I remember taking a course under the late James D. Bales before he got off on his hobby toward the end of his life. And he, uh, one reason I took his courses when I was at Harding was because, now we're talking about the late 60s, was because uh, he was noted for his debating. I had a strong desire to be able to answer error. I, could, I still don't. I could not see how you could be a faithful member of the church, I'll read about what that is in the New Testament, and not be prepared to answer error. How do you do that? First of all, I have to do that in my own mind to be able to know what the truth is and turn against error and obey it to become a Christian. Well, he was in the thick of it a lot of times. I remember him saying something in class that stayed with me all along. He said, a lot of people think I just debate because I just love a fight. He said, it's just not so. He said, I, I engage in these debates with atheists and others because I am compelled to by my duty to God. He said, if they knew the nervous wreck that I am 
by the time I get to the platform to debate from studying and praying that the truth not suffer at my hands and that truth be victorious. He said they wouldn't have that view, but that's the view people take, that you just want to stir up a fuss. I heard virtually the same thing come from Brother Guy in Woods. Now, let me ask you something. How much debating do you see today in the church? You know one reason why, and it may be the biggest reason. People don't care about doctrine. They don't care whether you're right or wrong. Just let it go. Everything's in the realm of opinion. Everything's in the realm of let's be good folks. And the idea of good folks is you never try to point out anything wrong in anybody's life. There's nobody that is a Christian in the full meaning of Christian as it's used in the scriptures that did not, number one, have to confront themselves and the error they were in, whatever it might be, religious or moral or both, and come to grips with the fact I am wrong and I stand by my error condemned before God, and if I die that way, I am lost. Now, until people can reach that stage, they're not ready to obey the gospel. And if somebody in the church has drifted back into that attitude, then until they can renounce that, turn against it, fight against it, and become interested in the truth for the truth's sake to the glory of God, they're not ready to come before a church and say, I have sinned. They don't understand it. So when I look at Elijah, I see somebody that whatever God had asked him to do from what we have in the Scriptures, and that's what we must base our study on, that he would do whatever God told him to do. And this was just the beginning. Elijah was bold, and this is another character trait, bold to rebuke sin and those that were living in sin. When you say that goes with the first one, well, yes, it does, because that's what God told him to do when it came to Ahab, Jezebel, and all that crowd. And you'll remember that upon meeting Elijah, O wicked King Ahab asked, Is it thou? Thou troubler of Israel. 1 Kings 18, 17. Now there is another reason that some who like to be known as gospel preachers, and I put that in quotes, like to be known as good, upstanding members of the church of our Lord. And they may look the part of a fine, upstanding, whatever. That's another reason the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth on any topic is not preached. Because if you expose error, you're going to be exposing the people who teach it. And they may not think too highly of you. In fact, I can guarantee you they won't. And they will do whatever they can. Hopefully you'd like to see them true to repent. But so many times they don't. Ahab never repented. Jezebel never repented. A host of others in his day never repented. But he told them what God said. But they never repented. What did they do? Did just what Ahab did here. You're troubling us. You're the troublemaker. I have yet to see the situation arise where someone rose up or a group of people rose up to expose error in the lives of folks that there wasn't some of those that had the error exposed in them that did not get very upset at the one who exposed it. I've never seen it. And you might as well expect to be called every name under the sun by these pious, loving people who say you shouldn't do that, but you see when you oppose error, they don't mind practicing what they try to condemn in you. And I've seen it happen all my life. I've seen it happen in others, and I read it here right in the Scriptures. Was Elijah a troubler of Israel? Or was he trying to get Israel back to where God would be happy with them and pleased with them? But sinful people who love their sins don't like folks who are righteous. Trying to point out that you're wrong in this area and I love you and I want you to repent and come back to God. Now, you know, thankful there are people like Saul of Tarsus who couldn't oppose the truth and he's stronger than what he did. But when confronted with the adequate evidence, he immediately changed and obeyed the gospel. 
So nothing's changed in the way that enemies of the cross operate. I would say if you're going to teach somebody the truth, you've got to let them know that if you stand up for what's right, this is going to happen. And the problem I've seen more than ever show itself this way is in families. Why people can fight a circle saw if it involves somebody else, but if it involves their children, then uh, they're going to try to defend them every way under the sun. And thus, I know no better way for the devil to get his way in the church than to simply operate that way. Because emotions take over. Facts fly out the window. Truth is unimportant. Just don't treat my little girl, little boy, or somebody uh, that way. Well, what way? Well, think of what Elijah said they have. He wanted him to change. They have knew exactly what Elijah was doing, but he didn't want to change. So who becomes the bad guy? Elijah does. You're the troubler. You're the troubler. So the false teachers, whether they bind where God has not bound in his word, or whether by their teaching they loose people from what God has bound upon them, uh, they will accuse those who insist upon respect for the authority of God and acting only by the authority of Christ and learning how the New Testament authorizes, they're going to be opposed to them. You're going to be a troublemaker. It would do us good to go back and read the early part of the 19th century when brethren began to recall to return to the Bible. They, they had to come to that conclusion if you go to 1800, very few, very, very few, of course, there weren't nearly as many people by any stretch of the imagination in what was originally the 13 colonies. And then by the time the Revolutionary War took place, got up to 1800, then things had moved out to where the frontier was Kentucky in that area and part of Tennessee. But there weren't very many people. Yet, you had folks saying, why can you have only one Bible, only one Christ, and only one God, but you have all these denominations? Why is that? So from among all these denominations, people begin to say, let's just go back to the Bible. It's interesting to read what happened, uh, how many of them were spurned and cast out and their whole people that had been with them just completely opposed them all because they said, let's just, do what the Bible teaches. We've had the privilege of building on many years on the work that they did many years ago. Uh, I remember as a young preacher when the people who have grown to be my age and now many of them dead, of course, were opposing the old paths and that the New Testament is a divine pattern. And that we must have Bible authority for what we believe in practice to be acceptable to God. I remember them making very much light of the preachers of the 19th century. And call them old mossbacks and everything else to get them away. Well, look at the church today. And you'll see where that's led. So when you look at Elijah, he wasn't troubling anybody but Satan and Satan's henchmen. Those who are faithful to the cause of Christ should follow the example of Elijah and the kind of stalwart character he had and answer the Ahabs who say you're a troubler of Israel by saying, I have not troubled Israel as he did answer Ahab. But thou and thy father's house in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and thou hast followed the Balaam, which of course were the false gods. You can substitute Bailey I'm here to make it up to date and say, follow the denominations. Follow the commandments and doctrines of men. Gone after the religious manuals and prayer books and catechisms and religious councils and synods and refuse the plain, simple, bold teaching of the New Testament on how to become a Christian, what a Christian is, and so on. But what's happened? People have gone back and embraced the very thing that at one time they came out of because they were more loyal to the authority of the New Testament than they were the commandments and doctrines of men. So who are the church troublers today? 
people who would be called troublers as Ahab called them in the Lord's church today. Well, first of all, the real troublers, not like Elijah, but troublers like Ahab, they've taken off the whole armor of God that Paul listed in Ephesians 6, 13 through 17. Paul said, that's what you've got to wear to be faithful to me, to where you can stand against all error. And you should spend time looking at that and see why Paul said it in the first place. If you're not willing to learn about the helmet of salvation, the blessed breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, and so on, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, then if you're not understanding that that means a soldier, a soldier of the cross, and you're a soldier because you fight. There was a time when people felt like it's something is worth standing for and something is worth losing friends over and losing family over to be right with God. The unfaithfulness and the indifference of many who profess to be Christians, this speaks volumes to those in the world that need to be influenced for the cause of Christ. We really have, lose confidence in the power of the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, the sword of the spirit of the word of God. And we get afraid, well, it's going to offend somebody. You know, I don't believe out of experience, if nothing else, I'll just use my experience. I don't believe anybody has ever genuinely been converted to Christ. First of all, convicted of sin and converted to Christ and all that the Bible says that means who has not been offended to the point of their inward man being pricked by the truth that they come up against and realize, well, I see I thought I was right, but I'm not. And in order to be right, I've got to change. People simply don't like to do that. And so those who show that to be acceptable to God, you must change your thinking. You must change your way of action and all of that, then that's, you don't, ask, you don't expect that out of people. That's not loving them. That's not caring for them. Now, if parents... And many of them, I guess, have the way things are in our society today. Well, to take that view of rearing their children, you would just let your children do as they pleased all the time. There would be no restraint on your part, no guidance, no teaching, no example of good ways and right ways the Bible put into practice. You would never try to correct them. They would never be taught that you make bad decisions or suffer the consequences They'd just be allowed to turn into what so many in this country have turned into. But that can't be the way it is. And why? Because I read my Bible and understand the words of God and I know what he says. There's another point. Members of the Lord's church who desire to be neutral are some of the biggest troublers, true troublers of the Lord's church and the cause of Christ. There's a reason that Jesus plainly taught in the earthly ministry, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Matthew 12, 30. You can't be neutral. And yet I watched it happen all through my life. You got something that's really bothering a church. Maybe there's factions in it. And some people just sit there and stare at the wall. They're not going to commit to anything. They're not going to stand. They don't mind hanging out to dry, as we want to say, or cutting the limb off behind you. They just don't intend to stand up. So if you're going to be a Christian, you have to be individually and personally convicted to stand for what's right because you know it whether anybody else stands with you or not. I think I see that in Elijah. I think I see it in everybody that served God that the inspiration selected for us to study and to emulate. And I see it here. Elijah knew who the real genuine troubler of Israel was. 
And we too, through proper knowledge of the New Testament, can know the same thing when it comes to enemies of Jesus today and enemies of his church. When there are people who claim that you can't know the truth, when Jesus said you can, John 8 verse 32, not only you can, but when it comes to salvation, you must know it. Well, I just don't know about that. Well, you must know it. And if you're declaring I don't have any interest, you're proving you're lost yourself. When you have people saying today, well, you, you can't say that person's wrong. That's a judgment call you can't make. And yet John chapter 7 and verse 24 says, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Well, what is righteous judgment? It's looking at people's beliefs and conducts in the light of a right divine word. And if their beliefs, their teachings, and their conduct is not in harmony with the truth of the Bible, God's already judged it. You just accept his judgment on the matter. But the devil has many ways to try to make the person in the church, oh, I'm a great pious person, when in reality... You're one of the greatest dangers the church has. And that would be true when it comes to the family or in society or whoever you are. Another point about Elijah is that false teachers who pose as religious instructors are the real troublers also of everyone with whom they come in contact with regarding their heresies. What well, I don't know what all the heresy may be. It may be you can partake the Lord's Supper on a time other than when the New Testament designates it to be taken care of. I've seen brethren, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, just say, well, we can go out to the creek bank today, and if we just take the Lord's Supper, everything's all right. Or they'll stay home, and uh, they'll take the Lord's Supper and ignore all the rest of the worship. I want to strongly urge members to ask themselves the question, where is the Lord's New Testament authority for taking of the Lord's Supper outside a worship assembly? I'd like to find that. I'd like somebody bring me the New Testament and show me where you have authority to take the Lord's Supper outside of the first day of the week worship assembly of a congregation. I'd like to see that. I grew up and there are a number of brethren who felt like, well, I can't get to church today, just serve me the Lord's Supper. Or they would take the Lord's Supper around to shut in. If you're not able to, to participate in the worship of God in song or in contribution or in assembling with the saints, then where do you get the idea to take the Lord's Supper? Has anybody ever asked why it's also called communion? Who are we communing with? If you read your New Testament, especially where Paul's correcting the church, in Corinth for the way they abused the observance of the Lord's Supper, you'll see he, that he will say when you all come together into one place and you do this and so. If, if we believe all, if we believe what we tell everybody else they ought to believe, take all of the Bible in its context, immediate and remote of what it says on a given subject before you reason with it and draw your conclusion, then we will understand why I would ask those questions. But brethren, you get the funniest ideas. And they want to talk about the denominations, and they're right many times about them going off after everything under the sun without caring about what the New Testament says. But then do we in some areas do the same thing? So the Apostle Paul charged the young preacher Timothy to preach the word, begin in season, out of season. He said, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, wholesome teaching. But having itching ears, will heed to themselves teachers after their own lust. And they'll be turned away from the truth and the fables. You know, there's so many itching ears in the Lord's church today, I don't think there are enough false teachers to scratch them. People just don't care about doctrine, that you must do what the Lord said in order to be saved in your sins. 
Now that almost sounds harsh. You know, people can be away from the truth so long that when they finally hear it, it sounds ugly, mean, and hateful. But truth by its very nature is just what a thing is. I may not like what it is, but it's just what a thing is. But we've forgotten about the nature of truth along those lines. In 1 Timothy 1, 3, we learn that Paul said that elders in the Lord's church today need to charge some men not to teach a different doctrine. Well, different? How do I know what a different doctrine is? I have my New Testament. God expects us to read it, study it, understand it. And the doctrine that it composes, whatever component part it is, we're not to be moved off of it. That's part of the work of elders to see that the church follows the sound doctrine, the wholesome teaching of the New Testament, not deviate to the right hand or the left. I will say this, if many years ago, if such had been faithfully done, the Lord's church wouldn't be suffering today. It might be a whole lot smaller in number, but it wouldn't be suffering today in general as it is and continues to suffer Denominationalism would be condemned instead of embraced and exalted. The last 50 years, people have been trying to figure out how to, they can be considered, how they, how they can embrace denominational people and, and not have to tell them, your doctrine is going to send you to hell. They just don't say that. Because they believe if you speak that way, then there must be something wrong with your attitude and you're happy they're going to hell. Well, I don't think anybody could more scathingly rebuke people than Jesus Christ who came, he said, to seek and save that which was lost. But ask yourself the question, why did he do that? Because people, certain people, were so determined not to follow God and still want to be acceptable to God. So every false teacher, regardless of what his area is, is a troubler of the Lord, a true troubler of the Lord, and not those like Elijah who taught the truth. The truth was meant to trouble somebody in error. You see that on the day of Pentecost. These weren't rebellious people. They were Jews trying to do what the law of Moses said. It says they were devout Jews gathered out of every nation under heaven. And yet they heard what proved to them they were wrong. And would that all would be like them. They were picked in their heart and they cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, I've been a lot of, like a lot of people that said, what are you people standing up there judging us for? Why are you just trying to say your little group's the only one that's right? That's what a lot of people would have done. How do I know it? Because that's what they do. So every false teacher is a troubler of the Lord and his kingdom and need to be rebuked, all the various wild-eyed programs that have no anchor in the authority of Christ's word and various gimmicks and three-ring circuses. They need Elijah's to confront them. Now are we such? Will we be able to meet the error of our times in the church and out as God called Elijah to do so and will we meet it like he met the error of his day? Sin must be confronted and rebuked. There's a reason for that. Paul says plainly in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Now, the people who don't really care that much about folks going to hell are those who want to let folks stay in sin. It's the only thing that keeps you out of heaven. Christ has solved the sin problem. The gospel is God's power to save. Men must believe it and obey it. So the need is for gospel preachers to truly be gospel preachers. And they need to be able to say this, be not deceived. Don't believe a lie about this. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. First Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Now, if you're a faithful child of God and you know people like this, how are you going to teach them the truth? and not confront these things in their lives, not show them what's right. And for godly elders to insist upon having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness 
but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5 and 11. If elders had been over the years what God says shepherds of the flock ought to be, they would have kept men in the pulpit and they would have kept teachers in the classroom who would not deviate to the right hand or the left of the truth of God's word to straighten their way. And they may not have had a lot of people stay with them, but when those folks would have seen that we can't change them, then they would have gone somewhere else. That just kills some people to think. They, they just say, we've got to keep them here. Why in the world do you want a cancer cell left in your body? You know what that cancer cell does? And physically speaking, we seem to understand that. It grows and it spreads. And that's exactly the way Paul talked about error spreading in the church. For some reason, we have molly coddled sinful members and to a, per, to a point to where members almost have to renounce the existence of God, the deity of Christ and the scriptures of the word of God before we'll even think about saying we can't have any fellowship with these people well I don't know where we learned that from the Bible but I know it is this, it's a deception, it's the believing of a lie now let's go back to Elijah and we close Elijah was anything like that Isaiah wasn't like that. Samuel wasn't like that. And so we must understand when you look at all those inspirations selected to say, be like them. Then that's going to take some backbone. And it's going to rule out letting emotions determine what we do or not do. It's just the way it works. We act upon what we know is right and wrong regardless of the attachments we have to people. If you're not a child of God this morning, we urge you to obey the gospel by believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him as the Son of God, and completing your obedience to the gospel by being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. The Lord will add you to the church. And if you've been added to the church, having done that and you've sinned, then there needs to be a disposition of heart to repent, confess those sins, and pray for forgiveness. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation? If so, we invite you to come to him while we stand and while we sing.